All right, I think we're ready to get going. Uh, I thought I would get nervous introducing Wanda, so I have like both my phone and a post it. <laughs> so it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Wanda Pratt. She's a faculty professor at the University of Washington in the School of Information. Uh, and she has done decades of work in the management of health and how technology can support that. It's an impressive body of work that I think that's why everyone in the room wanted to meet with you <laughs> and your schedule filled up so quickly. Um, Wanda's work is recognized by like so many awards in medical informatics, in HCI. I was looking at the funding sources, like well, all the, all the federal agencies and industry are supporting and um, uh, recognizing her work. Um, so it's, it's really an honor to have you speak today. Um, so what some of you might not know is that Wanda was on my dissertation committee, but she was not just a member of my dissertation committee. Sometime in my first year of PhD, I heard about Wanda and I was like, I, I like this person. And then I started going to her group meetings and that lasted my entire PhD. And if I didn't have two advisors, I'm pretty sure she I would have <laughs> forced her to become an advisor, but three would have been too much. Uh, and what some of you in the room might not know is that she was the advisor of our own Madhu Reddy. And I don't know if some of you in the room know, but she was a faculty here before informatics even existed. So uh, I hope this is an interesting return <laughs> uh, to the beginnings. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Elena. Thanks, everyone. That was a very sweet introduction. It is fun to be back and see uh, how much the program has grown and all the amazing faculty and students who are here now. Um, definitely been a long time. But it's great that we got a little bit of sunshine for me from Seattle. <laughs> Okay, so today I'm here to talk about uh, informatics to support inclusive and equitable healthcare. And I'm going to give a few examples from research projects, um, really focusing on the inequities that happen in healthcare that many kinds of people face today. And hopefully at the end of this talk, I will inspire all of you to address some components of these problems too in some of your own research. Although I know that many of you are doing some of this great research already. So first I wanna talk about how healthcare inequities are ubiquitous. They are all over and they cause harm. And we've known this for a really long time. There was, what was called the Institute of Medicine, um, put out a report in the early 2000s um, documenting the extent of this problem. They point to how much it contributes to problems with healthcare access, with trust in the healthcare system, um, with the care quality, whether people are getting the kinds of treatments that are recommended by guidelines, their healthcare outcomes are all different. And these problems unfortunately still remain today, 20 some years later. So what I'm gonna talk about is how informatics can help to um, impact these inequities. I'm gonna start from a little bit more of the pessimistic side of the ways in which informatics can contribute to some of these inequities, which we obviously don't want, um, and move on through to the little bit more positive side of thinking about using informatics as a method to understand these problems, and then finally designing with communities to try and change these problems. and. Um, hopefully reduce some of these inequities. So I'm gonna start with the understanding component and I'm gonna focus on accessibility. And I know you have great faculty here who do some uh, wonderful work and I heard there's a, uh, an event happening today that's great to hear about. But unfortunately in the health realm, in the medical system realm, they pay shockingly little attention to accessibility issues. Um, 
And here I'm going to be talking about people that have physical or communication disabilities for the project that I'm going to be talking about. And this project is, um, was led by Aaron Beneteau, who is one of the PhD students working with me. And it's looking at um, the telehealth experiences of people with um, communication or motor disabilities, particularly those people who use um, alternative and augmentative communication systems, also known as AAC. For those of you who aren't familiar with what AAC systems are, there's a lot of things that people use today. Um, things like eye gaze edge, where people can look at the different letters and um, type in information. There's a uh, face mouse. Um, LOMAC is a system that people use. There's a whole variety of different alternative and augmented um, a communication systems. So what we did is in 2020, at the start of the pandemic, um, we did a study with people who had engaged with two or more telehealth visits, both from the clinician's perspective and also from the, the patient's perspective. And uh, just to briefly go over the kinds of things we found is tons of barriers. So these people needed to use telehealth. We were in 2020, there was no alternative. Um, and you could see that telehealth actually might be really helpful for some of these people where the, uh, the mobility challenges for getting to a, a clinical visit is quite challenging too. Yet, when they tried to use a lot of the existing telehealth systems, there were tons of barriers. Um, they couldn't independently access the EHRs. Uh, some of the, the quotes from one of our participants say a lot of that kind of software requires you to be able to hover with the mouse, which none of the people in our study could do. Um, people had challenges trying to independently launch the video uh, conferencing platforms, um, particularly because there was often interference between the technology they were using to make it accessible and the telehealth system. Telehealth system would want to take control over the audio and video, and that then meant that their AAC system couldn't work. Um, so they were stuck. Either they couldn't use the technology they needed to interact with the system, or they couldn't have their telehealth appointment. Um, they also had challenges in the time required to communicate. Using an AAC device takes more time than um, speaking. And when we're in person, we can kind of see some of those cues that somebody is pausing to actually process and communicate. And online with the delays that just exacerbated these problems. And then, um, they found challenges with the, the policies and practices. A lot of healthcare systems forbid using anything but the technologies that they've approved, such as MyChart and Zoom. But if it doesn't work with the technology that the person who needs an assisted communication device, what are you gonna do? Um, some uh, participants talked about wanting to use WhatsApp or other kinds of chat to be able to connect to their clinicians. And the hospital systems and the clinical systems really forbade that. Some doctors ignored it and in the care of their patients went around that to communicate with them. As an example, um, who here uses my chart? Or, right? Have any of you ever tried to use it from just using the keyboard controls. Yeah, I have the students in my class try this and it's quite amusing. Now you can kind of see um, where, the, where the keyboard is positioned, but if you try to use some of the keyboard controls to move it around, where now is the, the area of focus? You can't tell. It's pretty much impossible to use my chart, which is the main health record system that uh, patients and clinicians interact with, um, if you're trying to navigate with just a keyboard control. So briefly, our conclusions from this study is that this inflexibility in the, 
the system as a whole, whether it's the technology or the policies and practices at the clinic, really got in the way of actually providing adequate care to these people who used AAC devices. Um, yes, it's true that a lot of these people could benefit from being able to use telehealth, but we need to improve across the board the systems to help them. Next, I'm going to shift to looking at, in a little more positive light, of using informatics as some methods to try and understand the kinds of inequities that are happening in healthcare. And I'm going to talk about two different projects around that. Um, this is the second project I'm talking about overall, but the, the first project about this topic. And this is around a, a bigger project that we called Unbiased. It's understanding biased patient provider interaction and supporting enhanced discourse. And this is a huge team. Um, I'm a co-PI, but uh, Andrea Hartzler at UW is the, the lead PI on this project. And we've had lots of people um, working on this for the past five years. To illustrate the challenge that we're looking at, I want you to take a look at this and think about how you are affected by first impressions. So here you're seeing somebody's face for about 10 milliseconds and you are making snap judgments of these people. You are making judgments about their personality, about whether they're likable or attractive, whether they're competent or trustworthy just by a 0.1 second image of the person. And that doesn't make you a horrible person. It makes you human. <laughs> That's what we all do. That's what our brains are trained to do. But it's a problem when it changes the way you interact with the person in the uh, clinical visit. It's a problem if it affects the healthcare that the person gets. And that's what we're looking at. So people make these judgments about how attractive, how likable, how aggressive, how competent, how trustworthy the person is just from that 0.1 second interaction. And we call these implicit biases. And these implicit biases we know from many, many, many studies play a role in healthcare outcomes. And it's not often a very positive rule. They, uh, the studies show that it, it leads to poor outcomes, um, to undermine trust, rapport, to um, reduced patient uh, provider interactions in efficacy and connectedness. So one of the things in our project we were looking at is can we detect any signals of providers implicit biases and looking at how that might affect the way they interact with the patients. So what um, we're doing is trying to detect these biases by sensing these social signals in patient provider interactions. Um, and this work really started a long time ago in a collaboration between myself and Mary Sierswinski at Microsoft Research but now we're um, continuing that work with uh, collaborator Nadir Weibel at UC San Diego and trying to automatically detect some of these social signals. So it's trying to look at people's body movements, at people's pitch, people's tone, pe interruptions that people make, and trying to link those with known social signals that play a role in how connected people are with each other and how well um, they are interacting. So we're recording these nonverbal, so we're not looking at the language at all. We're looking at how it's said and the body language that people are using and the audio signals and um, creating these 12 different social signals that we're using to generate a feedback report for the clinician in the way that they are interacting with their participants. So um, one of the things we've done is we've done some prospective collection of real world data at four different primary care clinics. Um, so far we've recorded 108 different patient visits across different providers um, and 
use those to both manually tag these kinds of social signals as a training data set and use that to develop some machine learning algorithms to try and automatically detect this. So the, um, the first stage of that is really looking at what are the, excuse me, the, the known correlations from this data set between uh, these social signals and visit quality. And we're looking at visit quality from both the patient perspective, where we're looking at things like satisfaction with the visit, um, satisfaction with the provider, difficulty, perceived empathy, uh, microaggressions that they might experience. But we're also looking at the provider side. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, this part of the work was led by PhD student Manas. <coughs> Excuse me, I've totally lost my voice. So we have a variety of participants in this work, um, um, varied by gender, race, and ethnicity, education. We also had people self-identify as BIPOC or um, LGBTQ or QT BIPOC. And you can see that um, the majority of our participants on the patient side were non-white. Um, although we did not have as many um, transgender and non-minor participants as we had hoped for. So what did we find? We looked at some of these social signals to try and look at, can they be a proxy for the quality of the visit? What does it tell us? So we did find some things. We found that um, here are the, the blue dots are the provider and the yellow dots are the patient and the pluses indicate a positive um, correlation and the minuses indicate a negative. So probably unsurprisingly, when the provider is attentive and interactive, uh, then um, they have a stronger satisfaction with the provider. Interestingly, when the, we detect social signals from the patient, if they're showing a lot of respect, then that also influences um, the quality shouldn't be uh, too surprising either. Uh, we also noticed some things like uh, patient dominance and irritation and patient distress uh, correlated with difficulty with the provider. And um, provider attentiveness, warmth, engagement, and interactivity uh, connected with or was correlated with the uh, perceived provider empathy. And similarly, in looking at the um, provider perceived empathy, looking at some of the patient characteristics, obviously, when the patient's irritation was down and their nervousness was down and their distress was down, they also sensed. Um, or perceived more empathy from the provider. Now, if we looked at the provider perspective and looking at what they were experiencing and the difficulty with the patient, we found that if the um, both the patient and the provider were less attentive, uh, were less warm, if the patient showed less engagement, those all indicated a correlation with difficulty with the provider. And of course, irritation, nervousness, and patient sadness, actually, on the patient side also correlated with um, the provider's um, feeling of uh, difficulty with that particular patient. So all in all, we did see a lot of social signals that could give us some evidence of visit quality and really connected there. But now what we're really interested in is the implicit bias side of things. So who here has heard of the implicit association test? Okay, so some of you haven't. The implicit association test is a, a measure that's used to try and get at some of these implicit biases. Uh, it's a test that measures your speed of responding to certain prompts, and it concludes whether you have some implicit race bias for that particular implicit association test. 
And that's the, the test we used here. We had all the providers take the uh, race implicit association test. Um, this data is very tightly locked down so that actually only two members of our team even have access to that data um, because that's obviously very sensitive for providers to um, not want that disclosed. But we wanted to see if there really was any kind of a correlation that we could see between these kinds of social signals and at least the results of this implicit uh, association racial bias. And we did see um, some signal here, uh, looking at issues of dominance, warmth, and interactivity, um, correlating with the, the provider's um, implicit association test. Um, so providers with greater implicit race bias showed less dominance, less attentiveness, less warmth, engagement, and interactivity. And they interacted with patients who showed more sadness and emotional distress. So it looks like there are some connections there between the social signals we're seeing in those interactions and potential race bias, particularly when we're comparing white patients with non-white patients. So the conclusions from some of this initial work on our unbiased project is that we can use informatics to help detect some of these implicit biases through the use of these social signals. Um, we've been continuing work on that and I didn't wanna spoil it, so I haven't presented this here, but we have a couple of papers coming up at CHI that's looking more at our work on what kinds of feedback can we give providers to help them understand this information, not trigger defensiveness, but actually try to take trigger um, learning and being curious and how to improve their interactions. And also some more on the automated tools for trying to automatically assess some of these um, social signals. So if you're coming to Kai, come take a look at some of those papers. And I'm still gonna focus on some of the informatics methods to understand health inequities but shifting to another project, the final project I'll talk about today. And that's looking at understanding how women's healthcare can be suppressed. In this particular case, it's, um, it's led by PhD student Heyoung. Uh, and our question really was about why does South Korea have such a low rate of unmarried women seeking recommended gynecologic care. It's a known thing. They have all kinds of public health campaigns trying to change this, um, but it's a serious problem. Our intuition, kind of following on some of the unbiased project work, is that it's a challenge um, of the microaggressions and the maybe aggressions and poor patient provider communication that's happening in the visits. Um, but we were starting this work in 2020 and uh, couldn't really easily access uh, the patient provider interactions in real clinic visits. So we decided to look at social media. Can we have any clues and an analysis of social media to help us understand more about what this problem is and what could be playing a role here? So that's what we did. We did a, a qualitative approach, pulling um, public posts from uh, Nate Pan and Korean Twitter, which are both uh, commonly used um, tools for people to be able to post anonymously and used a lot for getting health support uh, with this community. Um, we gathered uh, as you can see, a, a little over a thousand different posts, as well as gathering all the comments for a qualitative analysis. Hey Young translated everything for me to English so that I could help with this data analysis. And we did both some open coding as well as some uh, close coding where we wanted to make sure we were identifying different kinds of microaggressions that we're seeing in the posts. And 
as we expected, we definitely saw some evidence of mid-visit microaggressions, things that were actually happening in the clinic. So these are a couple of English translated quotes um, saying that what happened in their clinic visit was the provider with some kind of look of confusion said to them, you're too wide for an unmarried woman. Do you use self-pleasure tools in a condescending tone? More things of um, after noticing um, one of the patient's possible inability to have children saying, you're not gonna marry anytime soon. So kind of presuming that their only value is to provide children, I guess. Um, and then after the patient said that they had no intention of giving birth, the clinician saying, you're gonna be married someday, you need to have children, they bring joy. So these were pretty disturbing kinds of microaggressions that are happening between clinicians and um, South Korean women patients. Um, but we saw even more microaggressions happening online and describing other kinds of microaggressions because these are only happening once they choose to go to the doctor. The challenge is many of them are never even choosing to go to the doctor. So what's happening there? How can they be hesitant to go when they haven't even gone and had these experiences? So what we found were um, evidence of what we're calling pre-visit microaggressions. <laughs> this is an example of a post that we saw um, where someone was talking about their visit to see the gynecologist and the poster says, are you okay with losing your hymen? I think you're not taking your mother and your boyfriend's concerns in the right way. Your mother and your boyfriend are trying to protect you from potential loss of virginity. Of course, no mom or boyfriend will be happy with their girlfriend or daughter going to the OBGYN. They wanna protect you. So a woman had gone online to talk about wanting to go to the doctor for some uh, symptoms she was experiencing. And both her mother and her boyfriend strongly discouraging her from going. And she was trying to get some support online, but instead there were other people chiming in and echoing what she was hearing from her, um, from her mother and her boyfriend. We also um, heard about examples of post-visit microaggressions. So one woman said, I've had an examination at the OBGYN recently. I had severe vaginitis, so I told my mom, and she was initially furious that an unmarried woman went about to the OBGYN. She got furious for the second time, saying that vaginitis gets cured when you get married. I thought I was going mad. So um, these are all evidences of what's happening on social media when women who need gynecologic care are seeking some kind of support for going to the OBGYN or trying to understand and process what's happening to them in their real life. Now, we did also see some examples of real support. Um, this person saying, my mom also says that time will resolve everything and that unmarried women have no need to go to the OBGYN. I only made my problem worse by not going. So she's validating the other's experience. I hope you don't suffer for a long time like I did and you go seek proper clinical care. I know that what your mom thinks matters, but your health does too. So the question is how can we try and shift social media to be more supportive like this and not perpetuating these microaggressions? And this is also a global health problem. Although we were looking at posts in South Korea uh, where there's a particular socio-cultural context uh, where unmarried women are expected to be virgins, are they, they're impure if they seek gynecologic care or sexual, sexual and reproductive health care. There's also no term for microaggression in the Korean language. Um, 
which was interesting to me. I had no idea. So it was actually even challenging when I first talked to my student about this issue uh, and eye-opening to her to think about some of these issues. Um, and when people are trying to call out these microaggressions, oftentimes they get labeled as overly sensitive and um, their concerns invalidated by people. And that's in the cultural context of Korea, but there's actually studies that show that, that those beliefs transfer over into new contexts. So even when they might move out of that context, like to become a student in the US or any other place where the gynecologic care might be very financially and physically more accessible um, and less stigmatizing, there's still very low seeking of gynecologic care. So this becomes a real challenge globally. Uh, and I think many cultures suffer from some of these kinds of issues. So now I wanna shift to what can we do about this and looking at how we can design with communities to reduce health inequities. Uh, following along the same project. So we did a project co-designing with um, Korean women to try to counteract these microaggressions and try to create a more safe online space where they could garner more support for needed gynecologic care. Now, Unfortunately, the current approaches that are used in social media to try and help um, reduce toxic environments often focus on what we call um, macro norm violations thing, and also focusing on things after they've been posted. So they're egregious violations um, where they use slurs or um, hate speech, or they have verbal attacks on people, um, posting pornographic links, um, where they abuse or criticize the monitor, the moderators. But there's not so much work on how can we prevent this problem or how can we help educate people to, um, to address this problem. Now it is very challenging, right? Because microaggressions can be tough. They aren't as obvious as these kind of macro norm violations. And different people can perceive the, the same statement differently, depending on your background and your perspectives. So often there's what we call this clash of realities between the perpetrator, the person who's committing the microaggression, and the target, the person who's experiencing it. It's often the case that the perpetrator doesn't really mean to be doing anything bad. Um, that woman's mother and boyfriend didn't mean to be harmful. They wanted to be supportive, but they weren't. They were invalidating her experiences. But there's this mismatch between their perceived, their, their self-perceived intent and the way it's taken by the, and how it's impacting the person um, that's the target of the microaggressions. There's also this invisibility of unintentional expressions of bias. It's not always as obvious when a microaggression is occurring. It's a little harder to detect. Um, it can't really determine someone's intent um, from just what they're writing on a, a social media post. And then there's also this kind of pervasive perspective or perception that oh, it's just a microaggression. Um, maybe this isn't that harmful. Aren't you taking that a little too um, extreme? But what that doesn't acknowledge is the cumulative effect of these kinds of microaggressions. If every day you're hearing these kinds of messages, it makes a difference. Maybe one is not that big a deal, but a, but a flood of these throughout your life really makes a big difference and can make a difference in the amount of support you receive and the, um, 
the connection you feel and the commitment you feel to getting the care you need. So we did a, a study, uh, interviews, and two different co-design sessions following up with people with 14 unmarried Korean women. They all grew up in Korea. Um, they were all young, uh, between the age of 24 and 31, um, partially because uh, it's usually the young women who are experiencing these kinds of microaggressions and assumed to be promiscuous if they seek um, sexual and reproductive health care. Um, we asked them about whether they had any knowledge of microaggressions before, and the vast majority of them had not really known much about microaggressions before, despite some of them actually currently living in the US or not in Korea. Um, and it was about half who'd actually um, gone to a clinic to seek gynecologic care. So half of them already had that experience and the other hadn't. So the one, one of the things we wanted to be really sensitive about and something for you to think about if you are working with populations of, I'd say more vulnerable users, is that um, you're not gonna change the socio-cultural context. Um, you need to be able to design with them with the constraints of their reality. And that means you need to empower people within the structures of their society, not thinking you're gonna change society. Uh, hopefully, maybe things will change gradually, but that's not gonna happen instantaneously for sure. Um, and you need to focus on the kinds of tactics they already use to cope with these kinds of situations, rather than imposing your own cultural expectations and norms and expecting them to be able to adopt that perspective. So you have to consider cultural backgrounds, historical um, situations and experiences, and accept and respect their perspectives in the way they're designing and the kinds of goals and desires that they have. So with that in mind, um, we did have identify a kind of a core to their design goals. And their design goals in this kind of a setting really focused on thinking about um, an educational explanatory approach. So not as much a punishment where you're banning people from the list or you're throwing away their messages, but thinking about the people who are doing these microaggressions might be able to understand better and prevent them if they understood the consequences of their microaggressions, if they understood how people felt after they committed these microaggressions. And that, um, that the targets of these microaggressions can acknowledge the harm that the content has done to them. So kind of validating their experiences and making sure that people know um, that that affects their life, both for a value to themselves and being validated by other people's experiences and harms and knowing it's okay to feel bad that somebody has said this thing to you. It doesn't mean you're overly sensitive. So those were kind of the two kind of key insights for making designs from uh, their perspective. So some of the example designs that they came up with were um, in writing a post, they wanted the, the post author to be able to have more control, to be able to indicate what kind of support they were looking for. So things like informational support, do they want more information about what happens if you have vaginitis and it's untreated? Or emotional support of dealing with their mom and their boyfriend um, having these microaggressions. Um, what kinds of people they might want from it? Or do they want more of a debate about the pros and cons of this? So making, um, giving those post authors some control and also making it visible to the other people in the community what they're looking for. And, this is 
different, I think, from a lot of uh, current social media systems. Another thing that they wanted was to have some sense of what the comments were. So for example, some of the comments were actually microaggressions. So they wanted a choice. They didn't want it thrown away. They didn't want the person punished, but they wanted a choice of whether they were okay with seeing that. Are they in the time and space that they're willing to, to, to do that or they just don't want to deal with it? They also, even though it wasn't the focus of our work, they really wanted to be able to see the people who were posting and whether they actually were a health professional so that they could trust the kind of information that was coming from them. Um, that kind of professional certification badge is a more common thing on, on health forms. Um, they also talked about how to um, react to comments in terms of giving feedback to the people who are posting. So let's say you're responding to someone's post about um, having gone to the OBGYN. Um, and the system says, hey, what you're about to post contains a microaggression. Do you really want to proceed? Um, and having, they thought this was also very important, having links to educational pages for um, what it means to have, to do a microaggression, um, to having some mental health support. They also wanted to uh, flag different kinds of, of comments in terms of um, uh, what was a microaggression and also with an explanation from the microaggression. So uh, they could make it clear that it was a, a system that was sending this microaggression flag and a message of um, what micro, what kind of microaggression was being detected here and what part of it was, was a microaggression. Um, so for example, when you're posting something, the system could highlight like in red, these parts of your message that could be perceived as microaggressions and maybe using something like Grammarly to suggest different ways to rephrase that, especially now with all these um, large language models, um, it's more feasible to think of different ways to uh, rephrase the message without having microaggressions. So that's an example of a project where we used informatics to both reveal the microaggressions that were happening, really understand the situation more deeply, and also design with them in ways that were culturally sensitive and respectful to try and counteract these microaggressions and create more supportive, safe online communities where they could get the, the um, this kind of healthcare support and encouragement and respect that they desired. So in conclusion, I think I've shown several examples of how health inequities do abound uh, and can cause great harm. But informatics can help, whether it's using it to understand what the problems are, uh, whether it's using it to provide methods and approaches to try and um, understand the problem more deeply so that hopefully we can design with communities uh, and work with people to design solutions. So my hope is to really inspire all of you to do even more work on supporting inclusive and equitable healthcare. And that can take many, many, many different forms. That can be considering how your own work might create inequities or what you could do to adjust your work to foster um, uh, more inclusive and, and reduce these health inequities. Can you look at ways that you could include more people from underserved communities, um, even if that isn't the target of your research, 
or thinking about focusing particularly on some of these underserved communities? Can you add a project that focuses on these issues of health inequities? And many, many more possibilities. So my hope is that today you can think about it and make a commitment to one thing, because every the health behavior change all talks about small incremental <laughs> progress. Think about one thing that you could commit to today in your work and how it could be used to reduce health inequities. So thank you. And I wanna thank all my collaborators and participants and uh, why I did this one at a time. There's a link to some of the publications that I talked about in today's presentations. Thanks. I'm happy to answer questions and have discussion. Thank you so much for your talk. It was really interesting. Um, I have a I have a couple of questions for uh, related to your second project. So I think um, I'm biased. My understanding, yeah. My understanding is if I were the clinician uh, considering signing up for the study, I might feel like uncomfortable because I could be like judged. Uh, I, uh, because the study kind of assumes that you may have implicit bias when interacting with patients. So like I'm curious about like how you approach uh, the clinicians when uh, encouraging uh, them to sign up for the study. And also, um, um, there might have been like a like observer effect because the fact that you know, people are observing the patient provider interaction, they they might have changed their behaviors than usual. So I'm curious about like how like what approach what approaches you took to uh, minimize that effect. Yeah. So I think in some ways the the data that we have is like best case scenario, right? We we're only able to recruit providers who cared about this, right? So they don't they don't want to be racist or sexist or anything along those lines. They want to be a good healthcare provider. But everything we know about implicit biases tells us we all have them, and and it's going to make a difference. So um, I think the data that we have would probably look different if you picked a random professor. Uh, provider um, who didn't agree to do the study uh, and what didn't know that they were being recorded, it's probably going to be pretty different, right? Mm -hmm. But even in this best case scenario, we still picked up on the signals, right? Mm -hmm. We still noticed social signals that, that connected to their implicit biases, at least along the race lines. Um, so you're right, it's a challenge in doing this kind of work. Uh, and it, it was hard to do this work. It, it took a long time. Um, partially, we're talking about post-pandemic, so clinicians are burned out, they're overwhelmed, they're, they're already um, worried about their jobs and feeling uncomfortable, uh, and yet we're asking them to do this other thing, which is be video recorded and audio recorded in multiple uh, appointments. I think the observation bias is a little bit reduced because we had so many, it was just set up in the room and it ran for many days. So um, a lot of other studies have shown that once um, they kind of get acclimatized to that and they're in a hurry, they've got to run their clinic, they've got to interact with these patients. It's not like we bought them out of some of their care time. They still had to do their job. So I think that mitigated that a little bit, but there's Clearly, the thing of people were motivated to be part of. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I thank you. Uh, I have a question about the um, mostly the signing technology for culturally sensitive purposes, and um, really appreciate the talk. Very fascinating. My question is more around people who may have less intense in making decisions about their. Um, health choices, or even people who may have less access to, say, social media tools, 
Uh, where do you see, in your opinion, technology could potentially play a role? For example, in the story that um, one of the people on social media was talking about, the mom and the boyfriend, um, I'm assuming they wouldn't be talking over social media. So um, is, what, what do you see the technology, the role of technology could potentially play in situations like that, where it's more of like an offline interactions rather than social media online interactions with others yeah so one of the key things so that that actually was from a social media post that we took that i mean one of the key things was that these were anonymous posters right so the um the support seeking was disconnected from their real identity which um i think helped them be more free about discussing a lot of these issues um both I, well the nate pan site is disconnected from your real identity. Obviously, Twitter is not, um, but you can create you know, your own kind of account there. Uh, and I know it's not called Twitter here anymore. <laughs> but, uh, but at that time, it was Korean Twitter. Um, I think having, so having anonymous postings has its pros and cons, right? Uh, people aren't as, there's some studies that show that when you allow anonymity, that people can be harsher, and create uh, create some of these macro norm violations like sexist language and harassment. Um, and it also allows, it can allow people who are afraid to disclose um, their needs uh, in a very positive way. We've done a follow-on study using um, asynchronous remote communities. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that method that's uh, more of a long-term connection. And we did that also with, uh, I think we had 23 um, women from South Korea. And there we assigned them identifiers so that they had a name, but it wasn't their real name. And in exit interviews, that became very clear that it was important that we had both things, that there was a consistency that they still were identified with a name but wasn't their real name so people couldn't get back to their real person but they could still make a connection with others in this community and really feel like they were interacting with individuals rather than just the anonymous sea of people um, so that's one kind of thing i think these asynchronous remote communities can be a, a valuable way to connect with people um, without technology, obviously it's hard, but, um, you know, people are using things like TikTok and others to connect with each other and really seek support, even on these highly sensitive topics. Um, some other work I've done has looked at adolescents who've had inpatient mental health experiences and they, they formed an incredibly tight community in TikTok, supporting each other in, in amazingly supportive ways. Um, so people are finding ways to, to connect that if we can help create spaces where they aren't toxic and where they're more supportive and um, have some sense of being able to be themselves but yet be protected. Thank you. Hi. Thank you for the uh, presentation. It's really fascinating. I'm kind of curious about your work on uh, like the clinicians can visit bias protection. Um, I'm curious, like, do the uh, so this was in primary? Were all of them in primary care, or were like I've heard the different settings? You know, the patient provider relationship can look very different. Let's say chronic condition where it's more of a shared decision making sort of a style. So I'm kind of curious like if the setting aware these interactions are happening as well as uh, the provider type itself like the nurses versus sort of uh, and, uh, like social workers like do that do those play uh, yeah. so in our data collection we we did limit it to primary care. Um, partially because 
that's where the vast majority of healthcare happens. And it's also more like a best case scenario, right? You could have a, a, a connected relationship with your provider there. We purposefully included people who were nurse practitioners and nurses, and um, I think we had a few social workers. Uh, so we did try to have a variety of different types of providers. Um, I haven't finished analyzing all of that data to see if there's some differences there, uh, but we were aware that all the different kinds of providers could have these biases and, and it could play a role too. Yes. Yes, uh, thanks so much for the talk. Uh, so my question is about the AI technology and this feature. So what's your take on this question? ChatGPT would present uh, the technology's potential health or risk towards the uh, patient condition communication. Oh, you're going to have a hardball question. <laughs> uh, you know, there's lots and lots and lots of people talking about these large language models and the effect on everything, but particularly healthcare. Um, you know, as with everything, I think there are pros and cons, right? I mean, one of the things we talked about in the design for the detecting microaggressions, those, those kinds of large language models might be really useful for helping us automatically detect them and, and could be quite useful for helping to rephrase to avoid the microaggressions. Um, obviously, there are challenges with you know, the representativeness of the data, which lots of people are talking about. Um, but I don't think it stops with just the representativeness of the data. It's also, you know, thinking about how you're using this and, and what your, how much weight you're giving that. Do I really trust chat GPT to eliminate the microaggressions from my post? I don't think I do now. Um, so if it's somehow blessed by saying, oh, well, hey, it says it's not a microaggression now, and it changed it to be perfectly fine, and now you're still upset. And does that, you know, invalidate them even more? Um, because they're still feeling invalidated. Um, so that would be kind of where I would worry about, you know, before deploying anything along those lines, making sure that it's really trustworthy for the task at hand and that it's had the right representation of the kinds of data you're using it for? So we're, we're past time, <laughs> uh, but we have time for reception outside. So uh, stick around and ask, ask more questions afterwards and continue the conversation outside. Thank you so much, Wanda. Thank you. Well, I have a final question.